Good morning, and welcome to our service. The beautiful morning to gather with people that we love to worship the one that we love. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We thank you once more that we have this opportunity to gather together in your house to worship you. Just continue to be with us, provide for each need as you see fit. We thank you that you know everything about us and about our needs. And we thank you that you are so wonderfully able to provide for those needs. So, Father, we pray that you will be with each one that takes part today. Give each one courage and clear thinking to bring the message you've given to them, Lord. Pray that you will meet our needs. Pray that our worship will be acceptable to you. Just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We will have three songs and then the devil will have devotions. Good morning. Take the hymns of the church, number 607. If you're able, please stand. Number 607. Seven hundred three. Number seven hundred three.
774. Seven hundred seventy four. Who so love divine all Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Have you walked with God this week? Something for you to think about. I got a few different verses here. Um, if you want to turn to them as I say them, that's fine. You might not keep up. You might keep up. I don't know. Um, the first one is in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 18 <clears throat> and verse 14. 
and pay attention to what I'm reading. See if you can figure out if there's a theme here or what, um, what I'm going to be getting at. Verse 14, and David behaved himself wisely in all of his ways, and the Lord was with him. And then 18, verse 28 through 29. And Saul, saw, and Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael's, Saul's daughter loved him. And Saul was yet more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. And the next one is going to be in 2 Samuel 5.10. And David went out and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And then 1 Samuel 1.18. That one is not the right verse. Next one. 1 Chronicles. First Chronicles 11, verse 9. So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord God of hosts was with him. And then let's move to the New Testament, Acts 7, verse 9. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Does anybody know what the theme here is? Connection with God. Exactly. Connection with God and God's connection to us. Um, most of these verses had David's name in there, but I think we could all probably put our name in there too. But I, what started this is I wonder what happened. Why did David have such a great relationship with God that he got mentioned so many times in the Bible here that God was with him? Why David? What was about David that um, made him so popular to be in the Bible like this so many times in that very similar verse throughout? I probably didn't even get all of them. I'm sure there's more in there yet um, that God was with David. Does anybody know why that was. What do we need to do if we want God to be with us? I never thought about it this way as much, but I um, was listening to a speaker talk about this and said so many people wonder why God was with David when they don't realize the reason God was with David is David was with God. And so many times in our lives, we try and put God in a mold um, and how we think that God should be. And God's supposed to go with us wherever we go. That's not the case. We need to go with God wherever God leads us. And I believe that's the biggest um, misunderstanding that people have is they feel like God's not with them but it's because they're not with God. And that's why I asked that question at the beginning, did you walk with God this week? Um, if you're not walking with God, if you're not spending time with God, um, how does God walk with you? Um, he's never gonna be able to keep up with you if you're just off on a limb, just going this way and then going that. God's everywhere, obviously. He's looking out for you. But if you truly wanna have that deep connection with God, you need to walk with God. And then also, um, Joseph also, he walked with God. He kept faithful through the trials, through the hardships, when he was all alone in Egypt there, and God was with him. And then James 4.8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh, to, draw nigh to you. Is that the end of the verse? Maybe you're feeling a little bit distant from God. You think you're drawing nigh to God, and he should be drawing nigh to you. But the verse keeps going. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So just because you look good on Sunday or just because you read your Bible and spend time in God's Word and try to pray, if you feel like your prayers aren't getting above the ceiling, maybe you should check your heart and see if there's any sin. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And then Psalms 91.1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So once again, are you spending time in that secret place with God, um, your Father, your Savior? Um, or once again, are you just off hoping that God is following everywhere that you're going in your life? Um, so that's my challenge um, for you. Did you draw nigh to God last week? And are you going to draw nigh to Him? Or are you going to walk with God this next week? And if you have not been doing that, I guarantee if you do this next week, um, it'll probably be one of the best weeks of your life. Whether or not you have hardships or not, um, God will be there with you. And so the challenge that I want to leave with you is James 4 eight: Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Let's kneel for prayer. Lord, we come to you and thank you for being faithful to us. Just thank you for that promise that if we draw to you, um, you will draw nigh to us. And um, just pray that we would just allow you to lead us and guide us and um, to just allow you to be Savior of our lives and um, to not um, put you in a mold or think we know what you want us to do, but to allow you to speak into our lives. And just pray that you would be with the service today, just be with each one that's part, just pray that you would speak to our hearts and draw us close to you, and we just pray that um, you would just help us to grow in our relationship with you, in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, Delvin, that one was loaded. <laughs> the challenge for each of us, if God is distant, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. But we still have an opportunity to change that. We can always draw closer to God. With that, um, time is here to dismiss for Sunday school. The intermediate teacher is away so the intermediates will be joining the youth class um so with that the youth intermediate can be dismissed juniors primary preschool and the adults can take their place
good discussion and learn some practical lessons for us today. Oh, Caleb, would you lead in prayer? So. Dear God, I thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your love to us. Thank you that even though we go astray sometimes that we can come back to you. That you're there waiting for us. Just thank you for that. I pray for uh, Randy as he leads out in the discussion. Pray that it would honor you and that it would be a blessing to us all and encourage you. In Jesus' name. Lessons from the Potter's House. God often uses simple, everyday things to teach us divine truth. In Jeremiah's day, the work of the potter was something every Jew understood because everyone used pottery vessels. Spiritually, the potter represented God, and the pottery represented God's work with mankind. Focus is to allow the Lord, according to His will, to transform us and mold us to do what is right. And a quote I came across, or I heard this week, says, you can't follow the will of God unless you know the word of God. I think that's very important. So, let's start with man and go ahead and read the, the, the word from the Lord. <clears throat> the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go to the potter's house, and there I will call thee to hear thy words. And I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot, cannot I do with you as this potter? So the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant? I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy them. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build a if it do evil in my sight, that it, may, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit. Return, make your ways good. Now therefore, go to, speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own, our own devices, and we will every one do the imagination of its evil heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Ask ye now among the heathen who hath heard such things of the virgin of Israel, hath done the very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rocks of the field, or show the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Because my people have forsaken me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their way of ancient paths, to walk in paths of the way of cast out. To make their land desolate and perpetual hissing, Everyone that passeth thereby shall be astonished and wet his hand. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will shoot them the back and of the face in the day of their <coughs> So, does God ever make mistakes? He wanted it to. Whose fault is it? <laughs> well, what's different when you cut a two by four off too short? It's not the two by four fault. It's the person that did it. But that's not the case in God. 
I think we've all sat on a barber's chair. <clears throat> so if you get a nick in your in your uh, haircut, was it the barber's fault or was it you that moved? I don't think this vessel is able to move on its own necessarily, but I guess every example breaks down at some point. Yeah, not everything can hold true in this example, but and we're not talking about a beginner here either. Someone who's just learning pottery will make mistakes, but God's not a beginner. He doesn't make mistakes, and if something goes wrong, it is, it is our own Often our mistakes come from a lack of information or a lack of practice. God has neither limitation. Shows my ignorance about clay, but I had to wonder how easy is it to remake another vessel. I mean, how do they how do they soften the clay? Is it as difficult as it is to work with people? Same way I thought. There's only a short there's only a short window of time. You can remake it while it's still soft. If it dries out too much, it will simply crumble. Another thought I had to prepare the clay, a potter will take the dry clay and mix water in with it and knead it around to thoroughly mix it and get the air bubbles worked out of it. And there's no way around it. Making pottery is messy. It's wet dirt, and you're working with your hands. And it's dirty and messy. And it's not the way it is for us sometimes. And it feel some things in our life sometimes feel awfully messy. Sometimes we need that. We need to be needed and worked and got the air bubbles work out of us sometimes. So when he made another vessel, did he make the vessel as the vessel wanted to be made or did he make it according to, to him? It says that it was made as seemed good to the potter. The potter was still in control of molding that. Second vessel. He didn't mold it as we would want or desire. <clears throat> he molds it according to what seems good to him. <clears throat> That's a sobering thought, what uh, David mentioned. Uh, after the clay is hard, the potter can't work with it anymore. And. <clears throat> The thought comes to our mind, well, you know, I'll change later or I'll allow God to work this out in my life later or I'll surrender later, I'll do this later. No. Once God's Spirit will not always strike with man. You know, he is long suffering, but he won't always strike with man. It's dangerous to, to play with God in that way.
stuff works. It's really interesting to me, but you have to have the right amount of water and then mix a few other things with it to get the perfect um, texture and everything you want, and then it makes a really beautiful product. It looks all good and everything, but there's a little bit of contaminant in there when they bake it, it'll pop. And it's just kind of a thought, you know. We can have everything right, but if we have a little something wrong in our life, when we get under pressure or through the storm, we'll bring out that little piece of water take care of it. Down with the lump of clay, and, and with no plan in mind, just lets the clay decide what it wants to be as he starts working with it. And I think that's very real for us today. God has a plan. It's yeah. He's not just winging it and seeing what each one of us wants to turn out to be. He has a very real plan for each one of us. And even just to start with, was it just luck that brought the right DNA to, together to make you? You as a very individual, special person. Was that just happenstance that you are? who you are and there you go, make the best of it. I think this lesson is bringing out the aspect of who is control in our lives and the situations that we encounter. It's important that God is in control of our lives so the right thing comes out. But if you look at uh, engineering engineering here, and I don't know that much about why, but why would you have two wheels? When I think about designing something, if you want to make something go faster, have the drive wheel be big and the other one small and that gears it up. And I would think they probably use it that has a, a plural here, wheels. The bottom one is driving the top one so that we spin. Maybe sometimes we get pretty dizzy spinning faster than we want to be spun. Maybe that's what it takes for us to get in the right senses. Yeah, there has to be some speed there. We have to be in God's timetable. And sometimes, myself, first of all, I'm too hesitant. thought on the first pot was marred and then he made it again. Have you ever heard of God's perfect will and God's permissive will? Do you have any thoughts on application on that? <coughs> I don't know if I quite thought about that aspect of it. So. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. say it carefully, but that's that's God's ideal, so to speak. That's that's what he would like to see happen. But that isn't how it turns out for many people. So are you saying his perfect will would be that all would be saved, but his permissive will is some will choose to not be saved? Is that what you're saying? Probably, yes. What about the obedience and the actual work that he has for us?
Well, in Moses' situation, when he was supposed to speak to the rock and not strike it, God's perfect will was that he would simply, you know, he would simply speak. He didn't. You think of the other aspect. He did allow Moses to see into the land of Canaan, but he did not allow him to enter the land of Canaan. There are things that we will fall short of receiving God's blessing when we do not follow God's perfect will. However, sometimes in life, people's lives are taken because of disobedience. Ananias and Sapphira, what was God's perfect will? To tell the truth. Their lives were taken because he did. We're not guaranteed that God's mercy will be poured upon us if we disobey his will. And yet God has been very merciful to me and to you. In a later chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end for the future and the hope. his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. So, yeah, I think there's very real consequences for refusing to be molded the way that the master wants us to be. Have you ever come to a conclusion of why some God allows people to have a what we call second chance life? It doesn't necessarily chances, but put it that way for lack of better words. Other times you don't want to take an instant. I mean, the person would think, well, God's a respect of a person because this person is allowed to make its wrongs right, and the other person is like, you can't. What are your thoughts? As far as I'm here, you know, it should. To me, it looks like he's willing to give these Israelites more than one chance. But then you look in the next section, there is God knew their hearts. And is that why sometimes that he knows they're not going to consider their ways and repent? We don't know what all is in people's lives as far as in their hearts, and God does. So back to the question. anybody a certain amount of he uses the word chance I would call it opportunities um, he said today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts so if we've been given that one opportunity you can't fault God for not giving us an opportunity but it's by his mercy that we've had more than one opportunity Because I wondered too why, um, I mean, God told Jeremiah here from the start that these people aren't going to listen. And yet it seemed like God was giving them another opportunity. So what do we learn from history we don't learn? Giving, we're, we're, we decide we're going to take another chance. <laughs> it's maybe more an accurate use of the word <clears throat> in my mind. <clears throat> Does God not have an appointed time that He has for each one of us to die? Like even if a person would be living an upright life, that they would still, would, He would still take them at that point, whether or not they were living right, or does He actually change His plan if they're not living right to give them a second chance? Thank you. 
return to your question here about if God gives people second chances. <clears throat> Question to go with that. If we add question to question. Can a Christian's prayer, and when we talk about mothers' prayers for their wayward children, I mean, does that have an influence on God's mercy or His time people sometimes? I don't think we can really know. I, mean, I, I guess, but uh, we like to think that our intercessory prayers, God notices. What God does, what he, what he recorded in the scriptures, is his revelation of himself, his own nature. And so one reason for Israel being given so many chances is to highlight God's mercy and long suffering and his loyal love, his, his steadfast faithfulness to them because he was keeping his promises, just keeping his covenant. And similarly, prayer is often, if not always, uh, meant in part to draw us closer to God, to change us, not necessarily to change the circumstances, not necessarily to change the outcome. You can see in the Psalms, for example, many instances where <clears throat> the psalmist's trouble didn't necessarily go away, at least not in full, by the end of the psalm. But his outlook was significantly different because he remembered and rehearsed to himself who that is. mentioned the word treasure. What is a treasure? Anything? <clears throat> you hear the saying something of some people's junk is another person's treasure or something. But as far as spiritually here, what is a treasure?
not all treasures have to be expensive, <clears throat> but a treasure is something we're willing to pay a high price for. And looking at that, look what Jesus, what God actually did, John three sixteen. Is there any wonder why God puts so much time and effort forth in allowing us to be molded and shaped after His own image? Because the cost that was paid across the cross of Calvary, it was an expensive price to pay, knowing that many people are not going to accept it, but yet He was willing to do it. Do I treasure that? Says, and they said, there is no hope. Is that something we can be guilty of today? And what exactly is this talking about? goes on to say uh, in verse 15 then liking it how how Judah uh, how can they how can they just walk away from God how can they walk away from the water the life giving water the life giving hope that uh, their own source of hope their own source of life um, think about how foolish it would be to walk away from a supply of water and yet Sometimes we think it's not a big deal to just walk away from from our supply of, of eternal life. Well, thought of there is no hope. Some other translations would word it more of a way of what's the use anyways? What's the use? We're going to we know our hearts. We're, we know we're going we're gonna to fall. We're going to fail. So what's the use anyways? And yet when we have the that spring of water, like you were saying. Yeah, what brings us to that point that we say, what's the use and walk away?
the, the Bible is for if then. If you do this, speaking to us, then I, God, will do this. And that holds true in this case. If we as a people insist on spurning God's will, there is no will. But if we repent, then God will bless. And that's, that's true in this case. That's, it's not as much a reflection on God as it is on us. It's not God that's saying that we will. It's God. Or in this case, Israel. But today, it's still us. Christian all of a sudden it says there's no hope and that's it. It's, it begins very small, just like any sin in our life. It's very seldom that it's a big full blown issue all at once. It's usually a, starts as thoughts and it progresses until suddenly it's a lot farther than we ever thought it would go. There is no hope. Is a kind of fatalism, um, depending on how they meant it or what their thinking was. They could even have been blaming God. How, how can we? How can we do anything else? You made us this way. Um, a few chapters earlier talks about can can. Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots. And so may you do good if you are accustomed to doing evil. It's not that we can transform ourselves. We must be transformed by God. But it's not that there's no hope of that. It's that we have not desired that. We have requested that. Example of being responsible for our actions. The account of Cain and Abel, when God did not have acceptance of Cain's offering, it says Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is the countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. It all falls back to responsibility. And why was Cain wrong? Simply because he did something wrong prior to that. I think that's why the children of Israel respond like they did. They knew what they did before was wrong. They were not willing to take the steps that should have been taken, that their relationship could be restored. I would think that Cain could have repented of what he did, but he did not. And so today, if we do not repent, the consequences will we'll face. Cain had a very hard life to live after that. It wasn't pleasant.
Well, that brings our Sunday school hour to a close. Thank each one that took part. We will have three songs and then we'll turn the time over to the ministry. In the hymns of the church, 435. Number 435. So the Bible stands like a Six hundred twenty seven. Number six hundred twenty seven.
699. If you're able, please stand. Six hundred ninety nine. <clears throat> so, Lord, I am fallen. Say good morning, greet each one in Jesus' name this morning. Welcome each one to this part of the service. Our lesson this morning was on lessons from the potter's house. I was wondering if any of you had any testimony, any experiences you'd like to share of your experience on the wheel. Surely, as we discussed our lesson this morning, we reflected some in our own life, I would imagine. Or maybe you just thought about somebody else's life that was being remade. Most likely, we reflected on our life. Is it a one-time experience on the potter's wheel? 
or are we taken back to the wheel to work out those imperfections? Or at best, the last song that we just sang said, cleanse me and make me so that you can use me. This morning, Brother Keith is going to be bringing us a message from the Word. I believe it's in Corinthians, it talks about the washing of the water by the Word. So maybe it's a coming back again and being washed, being cleansed, so that we can be a vessel that God can use in His service. But I think for many of us, it would seem like sometimes we go back to the wheel and there's some things that need to be worked out. Just a number of notations or announcements this morning. The outdoor hymn sing this evening, you're all welcome to come. And the song leader has requested that you bring your Zion's praises. I trust you have his praises in your heart but bring the Zion's Praises songbook along. If you read your bulletin down through, sometimes we miss things, but on Saturday is the church picnic. And I'm trying to look here to see if there's anything that I missed. Are there any announcements that you have this morning? Just as a prayer request, Carol Schrock visited the ER this past week. I believe it was because of low, low blood pressure. And I guess in her statement, she is again doing okay, but I'm sure she would appreciate your prayers in her health journey. Also, Edna Hirschberger had a back surgery this last week, and she got along just fine as far as I know. She's not here this morning that I see. I'm sure she would appreciate your prayers as well. Maybe there's somebody else that had a health journey this last week that you'd like to tell us about. Probably we should remember all of our senior citizens that are, what, 70 and older? And then those that are under as well. Any announcements or prayer requests this morning? If not, the offering this morning is for home missions. The ushers can come forward. While they're coming, I do notice something I missed, and that's the birthdays this week. Sorry, Floyd and Cody and Loreen, but uh, Floyd has a birthday on Tuesday, Cody has a birthday on Tuesday, and Loreen on Thursday. Thanks for continuing to the aging process, and Lord, Lord's blessings this coming year. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we come to you again this morning with grateful hearts for your love and your mercies. We thank you that you have extended your mercy to each one of us this morning. You have given us opportunity to again assemble together, and Lord, we thank you for working in our hearts and in our lives. That you haven't given up on any of us this morning, but that you have given us another opportunity to again hear from your word this morning, to allow your word to cleanse us, to make us. May our hearts be pliable, may our lives be subject to your work in our lives, that we would be useful channels in your service. Pray your blessing on the message this morning. Pray you be with Brother Keith as he stands before us to again minister from your word. May it wash us, may it cleanse us, may it remake us, whatever you have designed for it to do in our lives this morning. Just bless your word as it goes forth. Think also of those that have had health issues this past week, pray especially for Carol and the Schrock family, pray that you would meet their needs in a special way, pray also for Edna, I think also of Luella this morning, pray that you would be with each one, meet their needs as they face challenges in their physical lives, Lord, we just pray that your will will be done in the lives of each one, pray that your name would be honored in our service this morning, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Greet you one in Jesus' name. It's good to be here. It's good to see each and every one of you here. The message this morning, the burden of the Lord was born out of my devotional readings a number of months ago. And I had to wait till I got through the ordinances to address it. So I had time to think about this. The subject this morning, I'd like to talk about is swerving. It's only found one time in the Bible. Swerving. Now, I actually think we use it in a little lighter sense than what the Scripture is using it this morning, but if you want to, you can turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. So I'm reading my Bible, and I come to this verse, and I have to pause and ponder, and I get a pen and paper, and I write down, message subject. How's my driving? So that's what I titled the message this morning. And I think this is a question that we have to ask to our brother or our sister, all right? So we are asking the question to our brother or sister, how's my driving? But really what we do need to do is slash out the driving and write living. Now which one of those questions is a little more popular today? How's my driving? Or how's my living? Which would you be more comfortable to ask your brother and your sister? How's my driving? Or how's my living? You know, you drive down the road. Where do you see the signs or the, the, the slogan, how's my driving? Where do you see that? Back of a truck, not on a billboard, right? No, it's personal. It's on back of our truck, not my truck. It's on back of the commercial trucks. How's my driving? Whatever the phone number is, I suppose 911 would work. How's my driving? Has anybody ever called that number? Raise your hand. One. I have not. Truckers, how many of you have had that number called while you were pulling a trailer with that on? How many got a report? How's my driving? One. Do you think that question is intended to have an answer? I know a professional driver that told me that uh, whenever they pull a trailer with that particular question on the back, they take a black magic marker and they change one number on their truck number. Then you can drive how you want. Floyd, in your long trucking career, Have you ever swerved? Is there consequences when we swerve? There's consequences when we swerve. And I think we use the the term swerving lightly because when you look up the word swerved, it is to miss the mark. It's not to be taken lightly, to miss the mark, to deviate from truth, to flat out fail. You see, when we, when we think about swerving in our driving, we consider it that we still have it under control, right? We just swerved a little bit. Swerving. How's my driving? How's my living? Brother David, you've mowed a few yards in your life. Do you anticipate, do you desire to have nice straight stripes when you're done mowing? Is that a goal? Well, I appreciate yards when they are mowed with nice and straight lines. I appreciate it. Have you ever swerved in your mowing? 
Did you know that when you have swerved, the evidence is there for the world to see? So when we're swerving in life, we are also being observed. And that is why somebody else could probably better tell us, how's my driving, how's my living? Now what does it take to swerve when you're just simply mowing the yard? Will you look back to make sure you're doing a real good job? You like to see how straight you're going. Or you're watching the birds, but you swerve and you're mowing. Now think about it. How do you ever get it straight? By keep following that same contour? Look what happens. It magnifies when we stay on that path where we have swerved. Now the, the, the really serious thought. So we swerved when we were mowing the yard and we tell our son, son, it's time for you to mow. Just follow my lines. Where's son going to end up? Is there consequences for swerving in our lives? Whether we're driving or whether we're living. Just last week, on a narrow Holmes County road, two vehicles meeting, and the one swerves to miss a dog. The consequences were immediate. There was a collision and the dog was fine. There is consequences for swerving. See, I think when we, we think about swerving, we think that we've got it under control and we're going to bring it back on track. And I want to look a little bit at that this morning is, is the fact that we must get it back on track. But when we don't realize that we're swerving and there's another generation coming up behind us and we tell them, follow us, follow where we're going. And another sobering fact is, brothers and sisters, is that when we're 60, 70, and 80 years old and we swerve, we still have not hit our mark. It doesn't really matter what age we're at when we're swerving. The fact is that we will miss our mark. We have not hit our mark. And in the commentaries, it suggests that this context that Paul is writing about, he is seriously saying they didn't hit their mark. They're not going to hit their mark. Swerving. I said I think we use that a little lightly. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, it is the same meaning. I'm going to start in verse 17 because there's a, a name of somebody here we're going to see again. Their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, that is the word that means the same as swerved. Now that's a little more serious because nobody here this morning would want to ever err in our daily walk, in our walk. Saying the resurrection is past already and overthrown the faith of some. So simply the false doctrine that they were swerving to was they were saying the, the resurrection is past and overthrowing the faith. Of some, there's consequences. We influence others. And the consequences was such that it overthrew the faith of some. And that's why swerving in our Christian life carries such, such um, consequences. Overthrowing the faith of some. And so we ask our brother, how's my, how's my living now? Let's transition a little bit. How's my living and he would have to tell you, you overthrew the faith of some of them. Paul said it. He named them. Their names are documented. And because they swerved from the faith, they swerved, it says they overthrew the faith of some of them. Now, can you feel the burden of Paul as he's writing to Timothy? I'm going to bring us to our text. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And the setting is Paul writing to Timothy because why? He left him behind with a huge responsibility in Ephesus, the city of idolatry, to where it says in Acts that the whole world was going out after the goddess Diana. All right? Right there in Ephesus. So here you have false doctrine. You have idolatry. 
And Paul has a burden of the Lord, and he's writing personally to Timothy and to us today. And it takes him, he didn't write these in verses, I don't believe, but it took him three verses to hit the nail on the head exactly what his burden was for Timothy. And it wasn't the notoriously wicked and defiled and debauchery that was taking place in Ephesus. That wasn't what his concern was. So here he's writing. I think I'm going to read the whole chapter because I want to address different parts of it. I want to talk about swerving. Let's see what Paul's concern is. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they, have, that they teach no other doctrine. Right there we have it. He bears his burden in the third verse. That thou mightest charge some that thou, they teach no other doctrine doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. From which some having swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for right, a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for prejured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to what? Contrary to sound doctrine. And there you have the two different doctrines. You have the false doctrine, and then you have the sound doctrine. And the sound doctrine, he goes on to say, is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting, to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now notice how he closes this portion of Scripture. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which sent before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is, here's that name again, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may... Learn not to blaspheme. There's some things in this scripture we're not going to look at much, but I want to read the entire chapter. Now we're talking about swerving in our lives. Paul says here, what some have swerved away from and what they swerved unto. Uh, I think we need to do inventory and evaluate where we are in our lives. How is my living? 
According to the words of Jesus, he said that the way is straight and narrow that we are walking. How much swerving is tolerated on the straight and narrow way? How much room is there for swerving on this holy highway? I don't plan to address all of the false teachings that are out there. That is not my desire this morning. I might miss some. But we need to know what the sound doctrine is and whether we're veering and swerving away from what we are, where we are supposed to be going. All right, so and he introduces himself. He calls Timothy his son. He has a passion to help Timothy and a burden for the church at Ephesus. And he writes this. And he says um, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Neither give heed to fables. So evidently there were folks that were giving, giving heed to fables. So when one is giving heed to fables, they, have been be they become distracted with what is true and what is false. What is what is right and what is wrong fables stories traditions theories you start entertaining those things and we start swerving to where we're looking and then he goes on and he says endless genealogies some of that is more important to us some of us than others some of us hardly know our genealogy. But when you can become so focused on the genealogy and bear so much um, importance on genealogy, you can have individuals wondering, who am I? Oh yes, I'm really somebody. Or oh no, I'm really a nobody, according to this. And so there we are, focusing on genealogies, and we swerve. And this is a couple things that Paul is seeing that's taking place there, and he's warning Timothy. It says that these things minister question. That is the first thing that false doctrine is going to do, that when we entertain those thoughts, when we're, we're distracted, when we start swerving, it ministers question questions. Is it so? Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Do I really need to be doing what I'm doing? And the list could go on. Paul knows that, and he tells Timothy these, these minister questions rather than godly edifying. How much genealogy do you really have to know to be edifying to your brother and sister or to edify God? How many old wives' fables do we have to know and be able to recite and to understand the purpose and why they were written to edify God? So if, our, if the doctrine where we're swerving does not edify God, then we're off course. And I said when we swerve, there is um, tragedy. But he does tell us what to do, which is in faith, so do. So what we do must be edifying, godly edifying, he says. Verse 4, verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved. I'm going to look at this a little bit. He says, from which. This is where they have swerved away from. Who has swerved away? He said, some. That means there are some believers who have swerved away from what they believed. But not all. Same as it is today. Not everybody is swerving. 
but some have swerved. And he's saying what they have swerved away from. They have swerved away from these three requirements that Paul has listed in verse 5. The end of the commandments. Charity of a pure heart. Swerved away. We sang pure in heart, O oh God, this morning. Charity out of a pure heart. Genuine love out of a pure heart. Pure motives. Pure intentions. Swerved away. No questionable activities, no questionable actions in our lives. We have a pure heart, we have pure motives. Charity out of a pure heart, swerving away. Without a doubt, sincerely love, loving and respecting others, swerving away. This genuine charity out of a pure heart is a kind of love that is accepted and received by others, swerving away. It's an unselfish heart. It's living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Swerving away. This charity out of a pure heart keeps our focus on Jesus Christ. Paul says they swerved away. Now, is it okay if they just swerve away from one of these. So they just swerve away from charity out of a pure heart. That's, that's all they're doing. He goes on and he says, and a good conscience. How can we be swerving away from charity out of a pure heart and maintain a good conscience? They just keep right on swerving. That's what they're swerving away from. The good, a good conscience. Paul says that this is the end of the commandments. This is what they're swerving from. A good conscience is a freedom from guilt. It's the inner judge of moral issues. The good conscience is a peace that passeth all understanding that when that good conscience is marred, there is no longer peace. Swerving right away from the good conscience. Where does that take us? Have you ever thanked God for a clear conscience? We ought to. A good conscience allows us to think clearly and to stay focused on what Paul desires us to, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we swerve away from the good conscience... We no longer have a clear conscience. We could have a seared conscience. When we have a seared conscience, we're no longer alert. And the swerving continues. See, I said we think when we swerve, it's just a dodge and we're back on. Paul says they swerved away unto something else. What's the third thing that they... Swerving away from, it says, and of faith unfeigned. So you think it's possible to swerve away from one of these and remain on track? Of faith unfeigned. Now what's that mean? Of faith unfeigned, that's without hypocrisy. That's an unwavering faith. And anytime false teachings and false doctrine is, is incorporated, our faith is shaken. Eroded. And these are the things he says that some have swerved away from. Faith unfeigned. In a boxing match, the boxer is feigning the entire bout, pretending to go one way and going the other. And you would say that's fairly unstable. You can't hardly keep track of them. In basketball, a player feigns one way and goes the other. Our faith cannot be like that. It's unfeigned. It's solid. It's steadfast. 
faith unfeigned. These three things, Paul says, some have swerved away from, and it's heavy on his heart. He opens up his letter to Timothy with this concern. So when you swerve away from something, you swerve into something. Whether you're driving, when we swerve and we're driving, we swerve into something. What did we swerve into? What did these group of people swerve into? It says, having turned aside, a literal turning away unto vain jangling. Now, you think Paul had a sense of humor? I'm not sure what that word is in Greek. Maybe it's not humorous in Greek. Vain jangling. It literally means babbling, vain talk. So if I ask, or if you ask somebody else the question, how's my living? And they would come back with a response, well, there's a lot of vain jangling. Would that be encouraging? A lot of vain babbling, a lot of no nonsense, no seriousness. That's what they swerved unto. So let's think about vain jangling. We swerved away from these godly characteristics that Paul left and he wrote. So they turn unto the popular opinion. A self-centered focus. When the focus, be- the individual becomes the focus and not Jesus Christ. You know, it's very popular today, I believe, in some doctrine, some false teachings, to where the individual is lifted higher than the work of Jesus Christ. The focus is no longer on Jesus. This vain jangling, I believe, includes science. Veering to the right, going down the path of science, reasoning things out. I believe this vain jangling can simply be unbelief. I once believed, but I can no longer believe. It's a veering away. I believe the works religion can be vain jangling. See what I do. How much I do and when I do it. I'm really all right. And the veering and the swerving continues. I think another thing that this vain jangling includes is the idea of personal preference. You see, these are completely opposing to the sound doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They swerved away from, and they swerved unto. I might ask a question here. Why do we swerve? Anybody care to answer? When we take our eyes off the goal. How does that relate to driving? Some of you obviously swerved when you were driving. Why do I swerve? I get sleepy. Does a Christian get sleepy? Nonchalant. Opens themselves up to false teachings. Not alert. When, a, when we're sleepy, we're not alert. When we're sleepy, we can swerve and not know we're swerving. What about the Christian life? What about our life? Swerving without knowing that we're swerving is a dangerous place to be. We get looking around, we get distracted. So there's a cross that needs to be our focus in order for us to remain driving straight, living straight. I actually thought about this this morning, truckers. 
What would happen if you'd put a cross on the, on the front end of your hood? And you point that cross the direction that you want to go the entire time. Is that fairly safe? Probably, until you get sleepy. How about mowing the yard? David, you carry a, a portable cross along, and at every end of every, every strip, you post the cross. And if you, if you aim for that cross every time, it's going to be straight. So why do we swerve? We get tired, we get sleepy, we look around, we get distracted. See, we don't really know these folks. Paul didn't really tell us who these folks are. He's just saying some have swerved. And their desire was to be teachers of the law. This is the part I don't plan to spend much time. They would have really desired to be a teacher that is looked up to as though they really knew something. And Paul says they don't know what they're talking about. Teaching about a law they don't understand. How well would you teach school if you don't understand the lessons you're teaching? That's false teachers. And then he goes on and he says that this law is good if a man use it lawfully. Laws are good. Laws are meant to maintain law and order. And then he gives a whole host of lists of different types of individuals that I suppose were in society at that very moment, just like it is today. See, Paul's society was not much different than ours. So should we say this morning we don't have a problem with swerving? We know what we believe. The false doctrines are like black and white. We can see it. Well, their society was much like ours. And he gives us lists of individuals and just in case he missed a few, he says, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, that's all inclusive. Swerving away unto something else. And I appreciate what he says about according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The glorious gospel. Now, I'd like to incorporate these middle verses here a little bit. Paul shares his experience of God's mercy and proclaims the name of Jesus. So even in his writing to Timothy, Timothy understands Paul's heart. He magnifies the name of Jesus in his experience. Now for us to stay on the straight and narrow and to keep our focus straight, we're going to have to remember where we came from, what we were saved from, and where we are headed. And Paul includes that right here. He says what he was. And he calls himself the chiefest of sinners. But then he met Christ. He says the grace of the Lord was exceedingly abundant. Verse 16. As I read this, I noticed something. He's telling us his experience. Howbeit, for this cause, I obtained mercy. This is why I obtained mercy, he's saying. That in me, him personally, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Now let's look at this. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul sees himself as a pattern that God did a work in his life for all those who come after that there is a pattern. Let me ask you brothers and sisters, is your pattern going to have some swerving in it for all those who come after? Paul was confident. He says he was, God used him as a pattern. There is no room for swerving. Swerving is, it cannot be tolerated. 
when we take it this seriously, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. And then he praises the Lord in verse 17. Praises the name of Jesus. Gives glory where glory is due. But he didn't stop. In our Bibles here. He has something else to charge Timothy. This charge I commit unto thee, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that thou might war a good warfare. He says this, holding faith and a good conscience. You see, he's repeating the same thing as he did back in verse 3, or verse 4. Hold on to faith and a good conscience. But alas, there are some who have not done so. Which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. It's no longer sir, swerving. It is now shipwreck in the eyes of Paul as he's writing. And these two individuals here he writes about have swerved and went shipwrecked. Destruction. A tragic end for one who swerves away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their end is tragic. When we swerve, it is evident that it's going to lead to blasphemy. That's what they were doing. When we swerve, according to this two fellas, we are really not in control at all. So Paul has a deep concern and he has a legitimate concern that he writes to Timothy about. Keep what you have. Avoid vain babbling. Now briefly, what are some ways to prevent swerving? Well, Probably the foremost would be doing what we're doing this morning is looking in the Scripture, understanding the Scripture, and knowing what the burden of the Lord is so that we understand what the gospel, what sound doctrine is versus something that it is not. But one way I think that we can prevent swerving in our living is to be convinced that Jesus Christ is enough. And I think there are those who, who search continually for an alternative. They search continually for something else, for something what they would consider better, because Jesus Christ to them just isn't enough. We need to be satisfied, as Paul was when he wrote in our text today, that Jesus Christ was enough. And like I said already, Another way to keep from swerving is to remember where we came from and where we're going. To know truth, to know Scripture. And as Paul wrote in another of his letters, we press forward toward the goal. Pressing forward. And maybe the most important to keep going straight is to keep the cross in our sight. There's a cross that needs to be in front of us. Our focus must be on the cross. I think another thing that we need to keep in mind is that we can never, ever improve on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us, and we must add to it for creativity and excitement, the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be improved upon. I think if we have a burden for the loss, it's going to keep our focus on the straight and narrow way. And if we remember what the way that Paul lived, it was evident in his life that our life must always glorify God. Our life must always glorify God. 
So in closing, it is important to recognize what I have swerved from in order to realign ourselves with Scripture. We must identify what I am swerving away from and swerving unto in order to recognize and realign ourselves with the Scriptures. Shall we have a song?
thank you. That anchor is the answer to straight driving and straight living. You know, I had to think of swerving in, the, in my life time. We probably all can think of individuals. Maybe we were in the youth group together, in school together, that have swerved at a drastic pace. And we wonder, how did they get to where they're going? It's called swerving. Shall we stand for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to be together again. Thank you for this congregation and their attentiveness. May you bless them, bless the word. It falls on good soil. You'd bring forth an increase. Pray that the name of Jesus would be honored and glorified. As we depart from this place, help us to drive and live straight on the straight and narrow Help us to be alert that we would not swerve. We thank you for the burden this morning of swerving out of the way, following after other things. Be with us now as we depart and make us a blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.